today we have two main areas of discussion. Today we're going to talk about breast cancer risk, preventive measures, and advancements in treatment, how we've more personalized our care of breast patients, and the latest new topics in breast cancer treatment. I'm going to start the conversation and allow Dr. Caroline Wilker to present this information. Hi, I'm honored to be here with you today. Um, thank you for taking the time to hear about my portion of this topic, which is breast cancer risk assessment. We are amid Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and part of awareness is understanding your risk. And I am going to talk about this today. First, I'd like to point out the magnitude of the problem. In the United States, breast cancer is the most frequently diagnosed non-skin cancer and the second most common cause of cancer death in women. Over 280,000 women are diagnosed with invasive breast cancer each year. That corresponds to one in eight women or 12.9% in a lifetime. Breast cancer survival rates have increased, and this is largely due to factors such as early detection and prevention. Understanding your own personal risk is key to being able to do this effectively. Next slide. When we as clinicians approach cancer, we think of ways to prevent, detect, treat, and follow. Today, I will review some of the ways we have grown to understand breast cancer, specifically as it pertains to risk factors and risk reduction. Later, we will hear about treatment from Dr. Christian. Next slide. A breast cancer risk factor is anything that makes it more likely you'll get breast cancer, but having one or even several breast cancer risk factors doesn't necessarily mean you'll develop breast cancer. Researchers have identified factors that may increase your risk of breast cancer. It is likely that breast cancer is caused by a complex interaction of your genetic makeup and your lifestyle. I have found it simplifies the concept to think of risk factors in terms of those that we cannot change or have an impact on, also known as non-modifiable risk factors, and risk factors that we can or modifiable. Next slide, please. Non-modifiable breast cancer risk factors include increasing age, certain reproductive factors such as early onset of your menstrual period, late onset of menopause, late age of first childbirth, a history of chest wall radiation, and three that I will go into a little deeper detail with include family history and genetic mutations, as well as a history of a diagnosis of a benign breast disease and an increased breast density on mammogram. Family history is in and itself a risk factor for breast cancer. When we speak of family history, we are interested in the number of first degree relatives with and without cancer, the age at which they were diagnosed, or a history of multiple cancers in a family. Independent from this is genetics. And among women who have a diagnosis of cancer, about seven to 10% have breast cancer predisposition genes. Some of the most well-known BRCA1 and BRCA2 are listed here, as well as an increasing understanding of other high-risk genes listed here as well. The provider can have a criteria for gene testing, including a family history of high-risk gene mutation, a personal history of breast cancer at a very young age, or with a family history, uh, as well as something called triple negative breast cancer, an ancestry that predisposes to cancer, a history of breast cancer in a male, and a history of breast pancreatic cancer. As we understand clinical genomics more, we are able to individualize this even further, both with a wide panel of testing listed here. And furthermore, there are many ongoing studies in Mayo Clinic that patients can participate in to even better explore an individualized genetic risk. Here at Mayo, after an assessment by the clinician, a referral to a genetic counselor can be made to assess the type of testing appropriate and can discuss also the benefits, risks, and limitations of genetic testing, assisting you with shared decision-making. Next slide, please. 
A history of certain breast conditions can also put a woman at increased risk of breast cancer. There is a wide spectrum of pathologic entities that is included in this category. Mayo Clinic led a large research cohort to investigate this, and nearly 10,000 women were followed over decades. Dr. Hartman in Rochester and her team helped us understand this, that some breast benign conditions, including proliferative lesions, especially those with a histologic atypia, should lead to counseling about screening recommendations and risk reduction strategies. Breast density is itself a risk factor for developing breast cancer. Breast density is a mammographic diagnosis and refers to the relative amount of glandular and connective tissue to adipose or fat tissue. It not only reduces the sensitivity of the mammogram in the, in the form of masking, but it is an independent risk factor for breast cancer. If a woman has been notified of having breast density on mammogram, an individualized risk assessment and discussion of options is available. Certain options include 3D mammogram or molecular breast imaging, which is a new functional breast imaging test developed here at Mayo Clinic, which can help us in the setting of dense breast tissue. So while there are many risk factors for breast cancer that we cannot modify, there are ways in which making changes in our daily life can help reduce risk of breast cancer. Known modifiable breast cancer risk factors include obesity, a sedentary lifestyle, an unhealthy diet, alcohol, and smoking. Next slide. We have research that shows an elevated BMI increases the risk of breast cancer among postmenopausal women. We have data to show that physically active women have reduced risk of invasive breast cancer, and four hours per week of exercise reduces risk by 50%. It has even been shown that light exercise in the form of household work has been associated with a reduced risk as well. There are various studies on diet. The WHI study, Women's Health Initiative study, showed that low-fat diet with vegetables, fruits, and grains lowered breast cancer mortality in postmenopausal women. Next slide. Alcohol intake has been linked to breast cancer, and this is dose dependent, which means a linear increase in breast cancer risk with the amount of alcohol consumption. Our recommendations include to limit not more than one drink a day for women. What is one drink? That includes five ounces of wine, 12 ounces of beer, or one and a half ounces of 80 proof distilled spirit. So while there are many, when a patient prevents to us, presents to us, we take all these risk factors and along with some tools can come up with an assessment of your individual risk and together discuss options for risk reduction and prevention, as well as screening for early detection. Depicted here are two of the more common models we use, listed in the top two bullets. The NCI Breast Cancer Risk Assessment Tool, Gale Model is another name, or the International Breast Intervention Study, or IBIS, Tyra Cusick Model. Next slide. Which brings me to my last slide and my last point, which is that one plan does not fit all. Understanding and collating all the risk factors with models and calculators, as well as a personal preference can help individualize your path for breast cancer screening and prevention. We recommend consulting with your doctor to tailor a screening plan that is appropriate to your level of risk. That can range from an average risk which includes routine screening to a higher risk, which may involve supplemental screening, such as the MBI I mentioned earlier, to the highest risk where proactive preventative approaches may be indicated. And always remember that each one of us can impact our own risk each day by taking action toward health and wellness. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Wilker. And now I'm going to take over talking about advances in breast cancer treatment. Next slide. The most important part of my following comments really come down to that cancer treatment, especially related to breast cancer treatment, is becoming much more individualized. 
that we look at the characteristics of individual cancer cells. We still look at staging that has to do with how advanced is the cancer when we diagnose it, but also characteristics of the patients themselves related to age, family history, and other health issues. We are trying to minimize the invasiveness of treatment and not over-treat and not under-treat. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna to highlight today what I consider the more significant advances in breast cancer treatment over the last decade. First is related to sampling lymph nodes. The job in our body of our lymph nodes is to filter our bodily fluid. Our breast fluid is being filtered by the lymph nodes underneath our arm. We have assessed the lymph nodes underneath the arm to understand whether breast cancer cells have left where the main cancer started in the breast and have gone to those lymph nodes. Previously, we would do a random sampling of lymph nodes. And this was really just related to anatomic boundaries, related to a vein and two muscles that make it a, a triangle. We would remove the tissue within that triangle, trying to get a sampling of between 10 to 20 lymph nodes. Now we have the technology to target which lymph nodes are most likely to be affected by cancer if cancer cells have left the main tumor area. We can identify these important lymph nodes by injecting the breast with two tracers. We allow the tracers to flow to the most important lymph nodes underneath the arm. We can then target and only remove those individual lymph nodes. The benefit of this type of treatment is previously in doing the random sampling of lymph nodes, there was a high risk of scar tissue causing long-term effects. That scar tissue could block the fluid leaving the arm and cause the arm to swell, what we call lymphedema. The risk of that was 20% of greater when we would do the larger lymph node sampling. Now with a more targeted sampling of lymph nodes, we've been able to reduce that risk to 5% or less. Now we've been using this technology since about 2000, but we continue to advance how we're utilizing this technology to keep reducing the number of patients that have to undergo a larger sampling of lymph nodes or that axillary node dissection. Next slide. We're also advancing our surgical techniques and employing practices that we call oncoplastic surgical te techniques. The first goal of surgery though, is to provide an excellent cancer surgery and reduce the risk of the cancer coming back in that local area. But now with oncoplastic techniques, we do the excellent cancer surgery while trying to preserve a normal breast appearance. Strategies for this include how we place our surgical incisions. It's also related to using tissue flaps to repair any defect. We can feather the breast tissue and be able to bring it together more easily, reducing any effect of a defect or a divot. We can also take larger sampling or areas of of cancer and removal of the cancer. And a plastic surgeon can come in and help us rearrange the remaining breast tissue, almost like a breast reduction surgery to allow the normal appearing shape of the breast. Sometimes this can actually enhance the overall appearance of the breast. We're continuing to develop techniques with our plastic surgeon colleagues to continue to advance this area and be able to offer additional options. For many years, people received chemotherapy as part of their treatment. And this was based for the most part on the size of the cancer, lymph node involvement, and their age. Chemotherapy side effects can be quite significant and severe. It can cause hair loss, Neuropathy, which is tingling and numbness that can occur in the fingers or the toes. It can cause significant weight change and cause nausea or vomiting. We can now look at the specific characteristics of the cancer cells and do what we call a genomic assay. The most common one looks at 21 unique characteristics of the cancer cells and is called Oncotype DX. 
with this testing and looking at these 21 characteristics, the company was able to develop a scoring system to indicate which patients benefit and actually need chemotherapy versus those patients that don't receive a great benefit from chemotherapy and don't need to have that form of treatment. This has significantly reduced those people getting overtreated. We're also continuing to advance this technique and information to keep reducing the people that may have to receive chemotherapy as part of their treatment. Now related to what Dr. Wilker was discussing previously related to hereditary cancer syndromes, this is an area where we've had significant improvements. We have known about the BRC1 and BRC2 two gene mutations for over two decades. However, this has really changed in the last five years. We've developed what we call next generation gene sequencing, which have really simplified the process of mapping out the whole human genome. So we get a lot more genetic information and we get more genetic information as we're able to examine more of the genetic makeup. This has really helped researchers identify other hereditary cancer syndromes. So we can potentially offer better screening to detect, to detect cancers at an earlier stage. And we can give patients options for risk-reducing treatments to reduce their risk of a breast cancer forming. With this advanced technique and sequencing, we've also seen the price or cost of this type of analysis go down. So we've seen more of it being covered under insurance policies. We've also seen significant advances in drug treatment. We are now seeing combinations of drugs that keep advancing the outcomes of patients. Some cancers, most breast cancers are what we call in the hormone positive. They have receptors on the cancer cells that might have estrogen receptors or progesterones. For a long time, we've been prescribing the endocrine blocking treatments such as estrogen blocking agents such as anastrozole or letrozole. These treatments have been very effective overall and have reduced the side effects. Less patients are needing chemotherapy. For patients who had, have advanced breast cancers, just recently have been developed what we call CDK4 and 6 inhibitors. And that combination of endocrine therapy or hormone blockers and these new in CDK4, 6 inhibitors, it's really improving the care with minimal side effects and increasing the longevity of these patients. We may see in the future that we're using the CDK4-6 inhibitors, even on earlier stage cancers, to help reduce the risk of recurrence. Next slide. And I consider this monoclonal antibody therapy really one of the wonder drugs of my, um, what I've seen in my career of treatment. Some cancer cells are what we call HER2 positive. This HER2 is somewhat equivalent to a growth hormone that allows a cancer to keep itself growing and getting bigger. These used to be fairly aggressive cancers. What has developed is that we have treatment targeted at that specific behavior of the cancer because that HER2 activity is pretty unique to cancer cells. So that these HER2 drugs come and affect that unique activity of the cancer. So this has allowed the treatment to be very specific to cancer cells. And so there's less overall side effects and the treatment has been extremely effective. Where patients with HER2 positive cancers now have a much better outcome and prognosis. And again, recently developed as an additional um, treatment, this uh, TDM1 treatments, which combines that HER2 monoclonal antibody with an additional drug. So it's like a targeted missile right to those cancer cells without a large effect of normal cells. And we can go on. I think the future of breast cancer treatment is very bright. 
future considerations on the landscape that are being investigated currently include the thought of detection through blood proteins and not necessarily having to go through image screening, treating small cancers with cryotherapy, which is freezing the tumor cells, or um, heat type therapy and not requiring surgery. We also see significant advances in imaging along the horizon. Currently, they're evaluating breast CT scans, what we call contrast, contrast enhanced mammography and automated breast ultrasound. They're also significantly, significantly enhancing that tumor genotic, genetic genomic profiling, which again is looking at very specific behaviors of the cancer cells. This will continue to, I, to target treatment to cancer cells and not affect as many normal cells. Thank you for joining us. I'm gonna turn this over to Lene Barkey to help facilitate your questions. Thank you, Dr. Christian, and thank you, Dr. Wilker. That was very comprehensive. You told us a lot as you declared up front about what to do in terms of prevention and the various treatments. Uh, there are a lot of words in there many of us are unfamiliar with. Um, I know one of the things that you spoke about, uh, Dr. Christian, was uh, you call them breast cancer predisposition genes. Uh, and so there is a question here about what is genetic testing and why is it important? Um, and I would just, before you answer, invite everyone that is on uh, the call here today to feel free to submit other questions in the Q&A um, function. Otherwise, we have some uh, questions that were submitted in advance, and we'll begin with those. So, Dr. Christian. Very great question. So, there are some families that have a, what we call genetic mutation, but a change in their genetic mutation that's making them at increased risk of cancer formation. And that gene mutation can be passed down to the next generation. And so we have been able to identify patients that may be at, who have a genetic a gene mutation. We can screen them more diligently to find a cancer earlier. There's actually treatment out there that is now more specific to patients who have a genetic mutation. And we can also offer risk-reducing treatments that can include medications or risk-reducing surgery. Thank you. Dr. Wilker, um, we talked about the amazing team of people that comes together in the Center for Breast Care. And, I mean, it really covers the whole spectrum of uh, what needs a patient might have. Can you talk a little bit about exactly how that team works together? If I have been newly diagnosed with a cancer, breast cancer diagnosis, how does that team work together uh, if there are a couple of those different couple of the different elements you might be able to describe uh, to reassure me as a patient of exactly what's going to happen. Absolutely. I would very much like to reinforce that this is a large team effort and a wonderful, caring, collaborative team that starts from prevention, risk reduction, detection, all the way through diagnosis, treatment with surgery, treatment with medicine, and survivorship. So from the start to the end, we work together as a team. What this looks like is discussing early with the primary care provider to incorporate uh, shared decision-making on screening. In the breast center here at Mayo Clinic, once you are part of the breast center, that includes our imaging, that includes our nursing staff, that includes our physicians, clinical genomics, surgeons in both breast and plastics, medical oncology, radiation oncology, and those working behind the scenes, including pathologists and clinical genomics and researchers, and our team that works with patients to follow after cancer treatment, surveillance, and survivorship. So Absolutely, what we would always want to say is that it's a comprehensive collaborative team that once uh, we are able to see a patient, we will follow through the end um, of treatment and, and care. 
And I would just like to add, as a team, we get together regularly and meet. And as a patient is newly diagnosed with breast cancer in our breast center, we have the team meet weekly. We review that patient's pathology slides. We look at their images and we make sure that we are all on board collectively as a team with our best recommendations. I feel this gives a patient many second opinions without having to go to multiple visits. It makes sure that everybody's specialty is considered when we consider the best options for that patient for the best outcome with them. And we do have resources we can tap within Rochester as well for those complex and, and difficult uh, uh, cancers where an extra um, expert team to help us is, is a phone call away. Thank you. I'm wondering a follow-up question to that is around, uh, you know, obviously someone who receives a cancer diagnosis is very distressing. What sort of resources do we have available to help someone who's really struggling to come to grips with that diagnosis? Um, I don't know if there are you know, support groups or, uh, you know, what other emotional support is available through those team members to support me? Well, I think we have a lot of support um, within the whole uh, cancer um, clinical service line here. We have the role of social work within the cancer center. Our nursing staff gets involved in assessing the psychosocial needs of the patient. And we have a multitude of resources to utilize. And that can be um, what might be causing this them distress? Is it related to financial constraints? Is it related to communication with family or having enough support with their care? So there are multiple resources that we can help facilitate uh, them getting to based on their need and what's causing them distress. Great. Thank you. Dr. Wilker, when should I start having mammograms? I'm sure you covered this, but let's review it again. It's very important that people know when to start yeah. and how often to be coming in for those exams. We didn't cover this yet, but we started talking about um, what to initiate in conversation with your doctor. So a little of that answer is dependent on your risk factors. So what we indeed recommend is discussing your personal risk factors with a physician and making a shared decision-making. However, in general, uh, we recommend mammograms starting at the age of 40, unless recommended to do so earlier based on risk factors. And then enhanced imaging, increased surveillance, uh, or preventative measures would be in addition to that. And is there an age at which I can stop having a mammogram? There are various recommendations for that. Indeed, um, certain... Uh, personal individual factors really play a role into that as well. So I often tell patients that we discuss their goals of care, their goals of level of uh, wanting to still continue to screen. And, and that is really based on an individual decision with a, a collection of health factors. And do I need to see my primary care doctor before making an appointment to have a mammogram? We, I think Dr. Christian can elaborate on this. Actually, patients within uh, are able to schedule a mammogram within our system without having a primary care provider. So they um, have access to get a screening mammogram here and don't have to have an order by a primary care provider to have that service provided. We also have availability for our patients who are patients within our system and are part of the online services to be able to just go on the online services and automatically um, schedule their mammogram. That's great. How about men? Can men get breast cancer? Dr. Wilco. Oh, we are here. talking a lot about risk factors and clearly uh, gender is its independent risk factor. However, men can and do get breast cancer, as well as a variety of other breast conditions that we uh, offer treatment for in the Center for Breast Care. We recommend absolutely if lumps or concerns come up uh, that, that we do see men, we see men regularly and we do treat men both for benign and breast cancer. 
And how about, is it safe to take birth control during my cancer treatment? Well, I think that's an excellent question. Um, overall, for patients at risk for breast cancer, we feel like it's safe for them to continue um, birth control. And generally, it is safe to continue with some forms of birth control. We do assess that and look at what type of birth control a patient is on and individually assess that, but do want patients um, to avoid pregnancy during treatment. So we do utilize um, and individualize that recommendation for uh, birth control during treatment. However, a patient at risk should feel that they can use the standard birth control um, even though they might be at an elevated risk. Thank you. And along those lines, what about if I am being vaccinated for COVID-19? Can I receive my mammogram during that time or do you advise that we hold off? The short answer is yes, get your mammogram when available to you. If you can notify uh, someone of a recent vaccine, that can sometimes be helpful. So what we know and what we saw with uh, a, the mass vaccine process recently with the COVID vaccine is that when someone gets their COVID vaccine, the immune system bumps up and sometimes can create some activity in the armpit or in the breast tissue that can show up on imaging. This does not cause a problem. However, it is visualized as activity on the mammogram. Sometimes it has shown and uh, required that patients come back. We do, however, recommend people get their COVID vaccines. We recommend people get their mammograms. We can speak and communicate about that and effectively evaluate the two. Right. And uh, Dr. Wilker, maybe we'll start with you on this one uh, about clinical trials. Are clinical trials a good option to consider? Absolutely. I mean, I think that clinical trials offer both uh, new individualized opportunities for patients and as well as offer opportunities to contribute to progress that we heard about today with treatments. This is one of the amazing institutions that has clinical trials and is available to patients. So at the very least, hearing about the clinical trials available, considering, uh, and, and um, if, if interested, participating. And I know we heard Dr. Christian talked about how the science has really advanced and you know, research and um, treatment options really changing over the past decade or more. Um, what are, can you just talk a little bit more about some of the ways that we work to preserve a patient's appearance after breast surgery or mastectomy. And there's sort of a follow-up question about nipple sparing techniques and options. So first in breast conservation, which is um, a patient saving their breast, adequately treating their breast cancer with the lumpectomy. With that, we're always, again, the first part of concern is doing a very good cancer surgery. The second thing we always think about next is how do we preserve the appearance of the breast? And so again, it's related to where do we place the incision to try to make it cosmetically, maybe not be as obvious in the future. How do we bring the tissue back together um, to allow the breast to have a smoothness and the normal contour? There's a lot of techniques of how we can layer the breast tissue and separate it to make it come together better. And I said we can potentially enhance the appearance of the breast. And I always ask a patient um, who has a larger breasts if they've been interested in a breast reduction. Because using that technique, we can reduce, we can remove the lump and provide, in a sense, a, a breast reduction and a lift and maybe give them a, an overall happier appearance if they've been considering that type of surgery in the future, but give them a very excellent um, uh, cosmetic appearance afterwards. For patients who are considering mastectomy as their surgical um, treatment, we offer reconstruction, which is forming a new breast mound underneath their own skin so they can continue to wear a normal bra. We have a multitude of options related to reconstruction, and we always try to 
um, save the, nor the normal skin envelope, um, if we can at all possible. This is always related to where is the cancer located? Is that a safe operation? And the ultimate outcome of how the reconstructed breast will appear. And I don't, do you want to say anything further about the nipple sparing? Well, again, we, I think the nipple on. sparing offers really our best cosmetic appearance overall um, if the nipple is in the right location. So as we talk about nipple sparing mastectomies, again, we consider how close is the cancer to the nipple? Can we save the nipple? But the other consideration we give, again, is that final cosmetic appearance. As we get older, as we've had children, sometimes our nipples can have a little droopy appearance. And the reconstruction is a little bit usually higher on the chest wall. So sometimes we don't preserve the nipples because we don't think they'll be in the outcome in the most in a natural appearance. So if we have to remove the nipples as far as that um, the cancer part of the operation or the out, the cosmetic outcome, know that there are several options related to reconstruction of a nipple that can be more of a surgical reconstruction or even 3D tattooing. We offer all of those options here um, at our facility. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Wilker, what does it mean if I have dense breast tissue? And if I have dense breast tissue, what do I need to do? Sure. Well, we talked a little bit about this. Understanding that breast density is a mammographic diagnosis. So that means that you have a higher proportion of fibroglandular and connective tissue in your breast relative to fat. And we diagnose this on mammogram. What this means is that it is both makes mammogram less sensitive because you can have some masking in there of cancers, uh, but it's also an independent risk factor. So what we have um, really grown to understand in recent years is that supplemental screening for women with dense breasts uh, is an opportunity for development and progress in diagnosis of breast cancer. We have really taking that on here at Mayo Clinic. The molecular breast imaging, which is the functional breast imaging was developed here, was part of a clinical trial here in La Crosse and has really been shown to improve diagnosis uh, of cancers in women with dense breasts. As Dr. Christian also alluded to, there are ongoing developments in imaging, including uh, contrast enhanced CT or contrast enhanced mammogram and breast CT that researchers and clinicians and radiologists at Mayo Clinic are ongoing, uh, doing ongoing work to develop. Great. I would say at a baseline, if you've been told via a letter on your mammogram that you have dense breast tissue to talk to your physician, you're welcome to talk to any of us here in the Center for Breast Care to discuss what options might be available to you for supplemental screening. Great, and we're almost out of time. We have one last question. Uh, there are some questions about chemotherapy and radiation therapy, and does everyone need to receive one or the other of those, or um, how, do you, how do you determine which of those treatments get used to help treat your breast cancer? Well, again, these are being further individualized all the time. So we're trying to best utilize chemotherapy for those that would get a good benefit, but we're really trying to not have to utilize chemotherapy for those patients that would not have a good benefit. So we base a lot of it on the specific cancer cell characteristics. When we think of breast conservation, breast conservation and radiation therapy go hand in hand, but we are looking at certain groups of patients, patients older than 70, not an aggressive cancer, smaller size, where they may consider not having to undergo radiation therapy and still have an excellent outcome. Within radiation therapy, they've also been reducing the number of treatments um, to re just reduce the number of visits here and, and looking at how can we um, have the best outcome with the patient with um, the least burdensome treatment. Great. 